Last winter was the darkest in the history of modern Ukraine. In October 10, 2022, the Russians began massive shelling of our energy system, and a month later, constant blackouts began. At that time, the whole country was preparing for the worst, a total blackout. However, this did not happen last winter. Some people called it a miracle, others called it the heroic work of power engineers. How Ukraine actually manages to keep the lights on during the war is a secret. We can show a lot of things here, some things are classified. I'm currently on one of the energy infrastructure facilities. Of course, I won't say there exactly. Today, the world inside out will lift this veil. We will get to the facilities where outsiders are strictly not allowed because these are priority targets for the enemy. The enemy can strike it again any second. Basically, the power engineers is on the front line. Everything was on fire. We're going to meet people who risk their lives to keep our homes lit. If you go to the shelter, then the country will be left without electricity. The enemy's cunning is that they're trying to kill the people who are doing the repairs. If someone makes a mistake and turns it on, it will kill us too, of course. And we'll talk into the future. What should the Ukrainian energy sector be like to be completely independent? I'm coming to the edge. Wow, this is our energy security. This is our energy front line. Our expedition is about to begin. The world inside out for the first time in 13 years in Ukraine. The world inside out with Dmitry Komarov, Ukraine. Half of the entire Ukrainian energy system has been damaged by Russian shelling. More than 270 hits were officially confirmed, and the World Bank estimated the damage at more than $11 billion. Kiev, Dnipropetrovsk, and Donetsk regions have suffered the most. Our expedition is going to the areas where the work of power engineers is most risky. We're going very close to the front line to join the energy special forces, who are eliminating the consequences of enemy attack every day. We're in Donetsk region. I come here to see the ordinary daily work of people who are truly heroes. But they are not military men. They do not take part in combat operations, but they risk their lives every day. They are power engineers, and now, after the impact, they are urgently repairing the distribution station with the risk of another one hitting us any second. This is a territory that is constantly shelled, and you will see what a heroic job these people are doing. Good afternoon. These are mostly damages caused by the hostilities. Can you see the traverse damage? Yes, it's a shell hit. Then the shrapnel pierced the tank. This tank contains transformer oil. It caught fire, causing a fire. This one is in a bad red one. This one is intact. It was also damaged. We have already restored it. Last winter, these were the main targets of the enemy. And it's not accidental, because these unimportant and first glance points are key for the transmission of electricity to our homes, as well as to schools, hospitals, communication stations, and other critically important objects. There are thermal power stations in Donetsk region, generators where produce electricity. Electricity has to be delivered to the consumers, to each person. For this purpose, it's transmitted through high voltage class through big wires. This 110 kilovolt line is called a line. This electricity comes to the substation, it's lowered to 6,000. So this 110,000 volts are lowered to 6,000 volts. Yes, 6,000 volts goes directly to villages and towns. This is a low voltage level and those are reduced from 6,000 to 220 volts and comes directly to your house. So you can say that this is a crossroads where a lot of roads lead in different directions. Right, it can also be called a node. How many families does this node feed? It feeds about 4,000 customers. 4,000 families. Right now, fortunately, there is a fog, the weather is bad, and this is fortunate because the drone can't see well, and this weather is good for the energy sector. If the weather is clear and bright, they can see the power engineers very well, and they hunt down the power engineers' teams. 
Thanks to the fact that we are now restoring this substation, we will have a reserve for consumers and they will have heat, light and water. Because without electricity, as we think, turn on the switch on the light now, not only the light in your house depends on electricity, but also heat and water. And reception. And reception, yes. It's very important to explain that when there is a real incident, for example, in a distribution station and the power goes out, it automatically deprives people of water because, for example, in this area, pumps are needed to pump water from the Siversky Donets River. No electricity, no pumps, no water. There is no heat because water is not pumped into the radiators. And there is no reception because the backup batteries on cell towers run out in a few hours. And that's it. No reception. Our lives depend on electricity. We are very dependent on electricity. Are you wearing body armor, please? Yes. Here, body armor is a mandatory element of everyday workwear. Although it's not always convenient to work in armor, power engineers do not ignore it, as they have been in situations where it saved their lives. Have you ever been under shelling? Of course. I got blown up on an anti-tank mine. I was wounded, concussed. But we're still working. Fear, risk, of course, anxiety. We have to do it. People need light. You have a big family? Yes, daughter, grandson, and granddaughter. When you go to work, Work, take you in armor, a tourniquet. What does your family say? They get used to you. You're at home, the lights go out, and you wait for the call. You have to go to work because if we don't go, who's going to do it? Our job is, as they say, risky and dangerous. You don't know if you will come home, if you won't come home, if you will hit a mine, if you will be shelled. You don't know anything. But can you imagine how I felt? I brought people up to 30 meters and the shelling starts. What to do? First of all, probably get the people down. You answered correctly. You got the men down. Yes, and the fact that they're already shelling is another matter. But you have to get them down, because if you leave your workplace and the people remain, your colleagues up there, what are they going to say to you? You left us to our fate, right? Right. Now we're going to dismantle the wires with insulators from the portals at the substantial. This is a broken wire, yes. Can I come with you? Sure. Give me the camera and Alexander Dmitry. By the way, Alexander is from the city of Donetsk and we are now very close to our home. How do you feel now? I haven't been home since the year 2013. It's so close and I really want to get there. My daughter has never been home, never. I keep dreaming of her seeing where I lived. When you come to Donetsk region, what the first thing you feel and think? I always feel like I'm drawn back home. It always draws me here, but the most frustrating thing is that my father died in April of this year and I couldn't come to bury him as it should have been. It was very frustrating. It makes you cry. Yeah, I can barely hold it back. Okay, come on. I'm sorry, Alexander, I'm sorry. You see, we all have our own personal stories. I'm crying too, to be honest. I can hardly hold it back. I knew Alexander's father well, and I knew that Alexander could not go to the funeral. It's all here, close by. Let's get back. Let's get back to work. This work can be safely called Energy Special Forces. It's really a rapid response team that goes where it's hottest. When there is a one-day rule for an impact, power engineers try to comply with this rule to restore everything that is broken in one day. We're now on our way up. We're going to hook the rope. While you have the opportunity, please tell me we are now, in simple terms, near the wires at the top. We are now seeing it up close. Tell us how it works. There is a current running through the wire. This is an insulator and it isolates the current from the portal, the concrete. This is the ground. The current should not come here. From there it goes here to the transformer. It transformed into a different current value and it's distributed further. Here is glass. There is no glass, just fragments. It hit here during the impact. Yes, a shrapnel hit here and broke it. Why do you need to change it? 
the current will go through them. If there is no glass, the current will go through them here. And so you say, it's like a current breaks through, it does. We all know the word ground. The current always tries to get into the ground by the shortest possible way. Everything is done to make sure that this current goes the way people need it to go, not the way it should naturally go. If it were natural, if not for this glass, then it would have hit the concrete here, right? Concrete also conducts electricity and into the ground, right? There is a very high voltage here, so it would have immediately gone. It's worth mentioning that electricity can kill from a distance, because not everyone knows about it. For example, if the voltage is very high, then the current can kill you, even if you don't touch the wire, it can kill you, because it breaks through the air. If there was a voltage here now, would we be killed here? Right now, yes, right now. We would even get here, we would be killed down there. Or if someone makes a mistake and turns it on, it will kill us too. Sure. Why am I saying this, friends? I'm saying this to emphasize the risk. The energy sector has always had risks. It always will have risks. I mean, working at height, working with electricity, these are normal risks. But now, during a full-scale war, there's another risk that we do not see. What was the scariest moment you had at work? Probably a high-voltage line, too. Impact was probably 300 meters away from us, maybe even closer, and we accelerated quickly. What were you thinking? at that moment. It was scary. A shell might hit this spot at any second, an FPV drone might fly in, a Lancet might hit, to cut these wires and leave people without electricity. That's why we don't tempt fate and repair quickly. We hook it up. We give the command downstairs and the guys pull it up. Tighten in! We need to hold it up here, and here we need to lift it up. Are you ready downstairs? We'll throw this one and this one. Mina, that's it. Mina. And now, by the way, we can see where the impact was, here. Look how much stuff fell here. Yes, the protection was smashed. You see, those glass things are gone. It's hit and through. This is what the impact does to the energy infrastructure. It comes in, destroys the metal and this glass protection, and simply tears the wires. And everything seems to be simple. Some glass plates, metal wires, but this is the power supply. Without it, people are without electricity. We need a fixing plate here. And now look, we're going to unfold it like this. We need to get it inside, so that they go inside like this. And there, that's it. I'm getting it out. It's a clamp like this, and it basically holds it. Hold it so we don't lose it. And now we unscrew it, lift it up, and take it off. This is how it looks like. And just imagine, when there are dozens of them plus glass plates, it's very heavily. I want to thank you on behalf of all our audience. Thank you, and thank you. We can see that it is getting darker, but the work continues. Power engineers are working from morning to night. Let's talk about today's realities. On average, how many impacts do facilities have per day in Donetsk Oblast? If we take everything into account, it's more than 15, on average 15 to 20. That's the number of hits to our facilities. Unfortunately, we have difficult areas, and we have 28 injured employees in total. 18 were killed, unfortunately, and 7 were wounded. The latest injury was this week, unfortunately, in Toritsk. We had a person injured as a result of shelling. He was wounded, thank God, lightly, but nevertheless, he was injured while performing his duties, his work. Your brigade was providing electricity to Bakhmut until the last moment. That's right, tell us how it was. We restored power to Bakhmut several dozen times, and it was cut off several dozen times until the city reached a critical point when there was nothing left to restore. To your friends, let me remind you that we are in the Donetsk region and we are watching the normal work of power engineers who risk their lives every day and expect something to hit them every second. This situation is one of the main goals of Russian shelling. To destroy a distribution station and leave people without light, without heat, without communication, the enemy's cunning is 
that they try not only to destroy their distribution stations, but also to re-attack them while the repairs are underway to kill the people who are repairing them and thus complicate further restoration work. Power engineers are basically on the front line. They are. There is nothing more valuable than people. No equipment can compare with the value of the people who work here, who stayed here, who are ready to support the life of the region. I'm grateful to those installers, those guys who tighten the knots, who get up at the first call and go to the line. Without them, we can do anything. Thanks to those who tighten the knots, because if they won't tighten the knots, the country will be in the dark. This is where it starts. There are thousands of such facilities in Ukraine. I believe that every Ukrainian who has electricity today should simply remember that at this very moment hundreds of facilities are undergoing repairs despite the snow and frost to ensure that Ukrainians have light in their homes. We must remember this and be grateful to the power engineers. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to live without electricity. We realized that last year, during the blackouts, at the beginning of 2023, the enemy managed to reduce electricity generation in Ukraine by half. For the second year in a row, our country's energy facilities have been haunted. Every Ukrainian has faced the consequences of the shelling. We were all without electricity and heat. I'm currently at one of the energy infrastructure facilities. I won't tell you where, of course, but I will say that this place was also shelled. The first thermal power station in the history of mankind started operating almost 150 years ago in the USA. Although the technology has changed, its essence has remained the same. The energy here starts with coal, which is brought by Okra Zalesnizia, and then we'll see what happens next. Hello, hello, Lubomir Dmitro, nice to meet you, my pleasure. There are 69 tons of coal at the car, plus 34 tons on the weight on the car itself, more than 90 tons in the total weight of the whole car. How much light can one rail car of coal provide? It takes 400 grams of coal to generate one kilowatt of electricity. That's one kilowatt. So, roughly speaking, one railroad car can supply a village for a long time. That's right. How many rail cars does a city of one million people need per day? About 100. You see, the math is clear and interesting. You know, you come home, turn on the light, and that's it. There's the light. You don't pay attention to this pressing of the button until the light goes out completely. That's when you start to appreciate this button, the light. Exactly, this is our job and we're very proud of our work. Let's go to the driver. Okay. Hello, what's your name, please? Yuri. You are tipping over railroad cars. Such a responsible job. Have you ever been under shelling? Impact was nearby. Were you scared? I was. We were working. What does your family say to you when you go to the work and they know that hey, you're going where shelling? To go to the bunker to hide, to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself because they're waiting for you at home. And I would add one more thing, that you are waiting for in every Ukrainian home, because if you are not there, there will be no light at home. Absolutely. Now millions of viewers are watching us, and everyone is worried about how we will survive this winter. Will we have enough coal? There will be 100% guarantee. We will still work, we will still be light and heat. It's shooting, it is. Our conversation is interrupted by a loud signal, which means it's time to turn the coal car over. The signal is on, the signal, and we'll see the light begin to appear. The entire platform rises with the car and turns it over. And the coal pours out. Ninety-two tons of coal were lifted in 30 seconds. The whole process takes up to two minutes. I'm going up to the control room to show you this spectacular process from the inside. Here is the signal. Let there be the light. Now I've pressed the handle and we're running to see what I've done. Here's a whole huge carriage tipping over, coal pouring out. I have to turn it back, right? Yes, go ahead. Start in position in the middle. One and back. A 
thank you for the opportunity to join you. You're welcome. What a huge place we're in, and there are many such places in Ukraine, a lot of them. This, by the way, also gives us additional confidence, because even if one of the places is temporarily out of service, the other one is still working. It is complimentary, quite right. If, for example, a car tipper breaks down, we always have a second backup one. Let's move on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are moving on to the next point of light production. After the coal is unloaded from the rail cars, it's distributed in this way throughout the entire thermal power station. And now we'll see the further path of the coal. This conveyor belt transports the coal to huge jump mills, a kind of giant grinder. You'll see exactly what happens there. The drum is armored and has metal balls in it. Are they that big? Yes. Friends, look how interesting it is. There are heavy metal balls. A lot of them are spinning in this drum with the coal and breaking the coal, turning it into powder. Why do you make it into dust? Because the coal itself burns, but not well. The powder is immediately ignited, a much better combustion process. But what happens to see the steel balls when they spin like this all day? They wear out. You have one coal. The balls also wear away and become these little balls, tiny. Compare them. This is the power and strength. This is how electricity is born. What's next? Is this dust fed into the fuel cell? Yes. Just imagine, the temperature of coal burning inside a boiler is the same as inside a volcano. We're lucky because today one of the boilers is not working. It's undergoing repair work, which means I have a unique opportunity to show you what is impressive objects looks like from the inside. Maintaining such a huge machine is also a real story. We'll show you in a moment. Good afternoon, Mitro, Vitali, Volodya. What is this room? It's called a gas chamber, and this is the hatch. What is is it used for? It's where the gases from the boiler rise upwards, then sideways, and the smoke is drawn back down the chimney. You mean a gas flue? The gases are not emitted directly into the atmosphere, they pass through and hit the stream. I climb into the gas chamber. It's such a good evening. The opening for passage is very narrow. Now our cameraman Alexander climbs inside. Now we are practically on top of the boiler. The whole thing is as high as 10-story building. Surprisingly, from the inside, this industrial giant reminds me of a musical instrument, an organ, with its many pipes. Inside each of them is a stream water mixture that is heated during coal combustion to 540 degrees Celsius and rushes to the turbine with enormous pressure making it move. And this is the defector part and we'll change it now. Here is the corrosion, see? They already hold, then it's not functional, steam is coming out, yes, only welding, yes. You can see how complex the system is. Even in this room you can see the floor is made of pipes, the walls are made of pipes, the ceiling is made of pipes, and all this for steam. The steam travels a long way before it creates electricity for us. All this must be carefully monitored, and as you saw, the tiny hole, it must be found and repaired. And the scale, look, the room seems endless. Thank you all very much. We run to continue filming. You have a big station. This work is very difficult, even in such locations where you have to climb in and out. Many times a day, people work like this to keep the light on in our homes. They are real heroes. Let's move on. And now I'll show you what coal turns into after being in a boiler. After the coal is burned into the boiler, the slag is driven through the slag hole. Everything just melts inside. The slag is liquid, but it hardens like icicles, yes. 
and you have to push them. From time to time, you have to help it fall. The slag we see is the waste that remains of the coal burns. It consists of glassy particles. I just see these small icicles and I push them a little. This is also dangerous because a big piece can fall here. The hot slag falls into the water, cools and hardens, turning into stones. The water just glows. This is how the process is completed. Coal has already produced electricity for us and it's no longer needed. This is a slag. Here it is. And finally, the last point of our route, where the light actually appears. Hello, hello. You're in charge of this area. Yes, I am. This is a turbine generator where steam is converted into electrical energy. That is, coal burns, steam comes out, and steam turns this turbine. Yes, and it turns the generator, and the generator provides us electricity. So basically, we need to produce a lot of steam, and we will have electricity. Yes. To put it simply, it's a dynamo machine, for example, based on a bicycle. You paddle and energy is generated. It's a big dynamo machine and not a bicycle, but steam turns a huge turbine. So briefly, how a thermal power station works. Coal is ground up and enters the boiler in the form of dust. In the boiler, it burns and heats the water in the pipes, turning it into steam. The steam turns to a turbine of a giant generator, which transforms this motion energy into an electric current. This current is transmitted through high-voltage power lines to substations, from where it's distributed to users. So a thermal power station is a huge kettle with a fan driven by steam. In fact, everything is very simple in terms of the technology itself. Today, due to Russian missile attacks, this thermal power station is no longer able to produce the same amount of electricity as before the war, and now you will understand why. And this is just scary to look at. This is a place that no longer works. Just now we're in the place where work was in full swing, and here it is. There's no life here anymore, no work. It feels like we're somewhere in Chernobyl. Russian missiles hit here. The damage here is worth many billions of premiums. It will take many years to restore it. I don't know about you, it hurts me to look at all this. To be honest, the first few minutes after the shelling, we also had tears in our eyes. It was a day off. People came from home outside of their working hours and immediately started to eliminate the accident accident because there was a strong fire and it was necessary to localize it so the fire would not spread to other equipment. How did this hit affect the energy sector? For example, this unit could power 10 tons like the one I live in. That's a 10 Ukrainian city. Yes. Cruel math. Let's be honest, many of us, when there was no electricity for a long time, probably sat on emotion, why did it take so long? Why were such long blackouts? And when you come here, such questions no longer arise. There are workers of TPS who cannot leave their workplace even during missile shelling because even at such moments they have to control the operation of the entire power station, although they are the ones who are targeted by the missiles. And now we're going to visit the epicenter of the system control. Hello everyone, hello. There is a lot we cannot show here, some things are classified, but you have an exceptional opportunity to your friends to see how electricity production is managed. In a nutshell, what is going on here? I monitor the parameters of the unit, the levels of the rotors, the combustion process. It's essentially a control center. If there is a shelling, your colleagues run to the shelter, but you cannot. They're aiming here. What do you do? Since we're not allowed to run away or leave the workplace, we were immediately given helmets. We put them on. Everyone goes to the shelter and you put on your helmet. Do you have bulletproof vests? Yes, we have. Look. These are peculiarities of work. If you go to the shelter, the country will be left without electricity. What's your name, sir? Igor. 
Do you have a big family? Children, a wife. What are the kids' names? Rita and Justin. What is your wife's name? Maria. Friends, look, Eher cannot run to shelter during the air raid because here we cannot show you the details. He does such a job in this workplace at a computer that if he leaves, millions of people will be without electricity. I thank you in your person to thousands, tens of thousands of Ukrainian power engineers. Thank you. Today, Ukrainian thermal power stations are the main targets of Russian shelling. They can be hit in any moment. Every TPS worker knows that it's like to be a target and to consciously take risks. It just so happened that our shift had to survive almost all the explosions in the station. Even the TPS workers used to joke that if it isn't in our shift, that everything will be fine today. The first impact was the most severe. All the windows were smashed, all the glass of the blockhouse was smashed. There were some devices damaged. It's scary when a missile hits the ground, and then it's as powerful as an earthquake. It's scary. The worst part is waiting for the missile to hit us. It's not the explosion itself that's scary for me, but waiting for it to arrive. When you know that's coming and it's coming at you, yes, that it's the aftermath, you're alive, you're okay, we save the equipment as best we can. What the scariest moment? It was scary when the fire started. Everything was in fire. We stopped blocks and started putting out the fire. What do people say at home? They say that they're even more scared for me than I am for myself. Even my friends from the front line called me and I asked, how do you know that we have already been hit? It's a paradox, isn't it? People from the front line are calling to ask if you're alive, here in the city, not near the front line. Yeah. But when you're in an energy facility, you're essentially at the front line. And what is your main motivation to keep going to work, knowing about all the risks, realizing the risks? If everyone lives, who will work? Someone has to keep the lights on. The emergency workers may also leave their job because they also have a risk there, right? Doctors can leave and the military can leave, but they don't. Commitment, yes, for yourself, for your family, for your country. I'm very grateful to you for your work, for your courage. In general, more than half of Ukraine's electricity is generated by nuclear power plants. About 25% is generated by thermal power stations and 9% by combined heat and power stations, another type of thermal power station. Another 10% of Ukrainian electricity is generated by the hydroelectric power plants and about 5% by solar and wind power plants. Before the Great War, the share of green generation was over 13% and was increasing. However, after the start of the full-scale invasion, many solar and wind power plants were occupied in the south of the country. However, the future of global energy lies in green technologies, and now we're going to show you one of the largest Ukrainian wind farms that helped save the south during the blackouts last year. Hello friends, we're at the altitude of 125 meters, and this is a wind farm. It looks like it's uh, just a big fan. You can say that, but it's an inside-out fan, because it doesn't need to be plugged in. On the contrary, it powers the sockets, provides electricity. This is the most useful propeller in Ukraine. Just imagine, one such windmill can supply electricity to an entire village, 12,000 families. And now we'll find out how it works. We'll be assisted by the windmill expert, the director of the Tillyhole Wind Farm. You know, it's very impressive when you come up and look at it up close. It's as big as a 45-story building. And one blade is 80 meters long. Let's imagine that this area is like two football fields. It's the blades that are responsible for how much electricity the windmill will produce. The larger the blade area, the more wind energy can be captured and converted into electricity. That's why they're so huge. These blades are an engineering miracle in themselves because they adjust themselves and catch the wind when there's almost no wind. And if the gust is too strong, the windmill automatically stops to avoid an accident. 
And how much does it weigh? One blade is only 20 tons. 20 tons for one blade, that's it. 60 tons are spinning now. It seems that just watching it fly at you, that just can break off and fall, just like in the movies. But it's impossible to estimate the real size of these giant fans when you're standing next to them. We're getting closer to the windmill that hasn't been assembled yet, and now its scale becomes clear. Wow, you get closer and it just looks like a railroad car, a tank. It's huge. Let's get even closer. Okay, there are five sections, and these five sections are assembled into one tower, 125 meters long. Friends, look at the scale and this pipe. How long is it? It's about 30 meters long. Let's measure it. Just like Alexander and I used to do when we traveled in the jungle. Here we go. It's very simple, step by step. Here's the beginning, and here we go. 1, 2, 13, 14, 25, 26, 33 of my steps. And this is just one section. And there are five such sections. How did such huge details end up in the middle of the steps in our south? This is a really complex project. First, the windmill parts are delivered by sea. Then they are loaded onto huge trailers, trolls, and transported by land. In order to such a machine to drive through the city, all the power lines along the route are specially raised and then returned to their place. Parts of the windmill are transported only accompanied by the police who block the road in some places so that these giants can pass. The sound is not very loud, so it's not like when you turn on the fan at home and you can't hear anything. And here is such a huge machine and the sound is quite quiet. Because when you look closer and this blade, it has these teeth on it. And when it spins, it cuts the air with these teeth so as not to create such a loud sound. But not everyone receives new technologies equally well. They said that these windmills could make clouds spin around them, and it works not rain, the worms in the ground will disappear, the land will not produce. But we explain that these are all myths, that the whole of Europe is powered by such beauties. And this is our future, the future of our energy sector. The world's largest producers of wind power are China, the United States, and Denmark. Imagine just one complex of wind farms in Jiuquan, China, produces enough electricity to supply an entire country, such as Estonia. There are more and more offshore power plants in the world. In the European Union, 17% of electricity is generated by wind, and even in countries that we consider exotic, they also use wind power. Brazil ranks eighth in the world in terms of wind power generation. It's very cool, it's absolutely safe and vital. Environmentally, it doesn't carry any risks of accidents, such as a nuclear power plant explosion or a dam break. This is what we should strive for. This is our future. Ukraine is only at the beginning of its journey, but it's already making leaps and bounds towards the goal. Now we can see what it's like from the inside. From the inside, the base of the windmill looks like more like a subway tunnel. It's impressive. What is the diameter here? Four and a half meters. Can we go inside? Yes, please. I really like the sound. It's so interesting. The echo. Is this all made by Ukrainian masters? The installations we made during the war were all made by Ukrainian masters, our specialists. You see, in France, it happens essentially all of this was done by foreigners in Ukraine. But with the outbreak of full-scale war, foreigners left, masters and specialists left, and our people had to learn very quickly. Exactly. You see, at first, no one believed that it was possible for Ukrainians to do this. So when the foreigners left, everyone thought that the project was over. That's right, because foreigners have always performed high-tech operations. They left, and we didn't understand how we could do it ourselves. But when we made the first turbine and assembled it, we said to ourselves, yes, we did it. And for us, it was a... And by the way, you became a record holders, because this is the world's first windmill and wind farm entirety made during the full-scale war. Yes, the 
construction of these giants begins with a foundation of which huge pipes are attached. Here we see the foundation, the whole turbine stands on it. How many tons? 750 tons, the whole turbine. And this is the foundation for 750 tons. Yes, it's impressive too, very powerful. But if we talk about the current situation, the risk of shelling, is it possible to destroy such a powerful but tall structure in the case of Russian shelling? It is indeed possible to get hit. But look, these windmills are almost a kilometer apart, so it's very difficult to do that. Yes, we see seven windmills, it seems that they are close. They are a kilometer away, and there is also a kilometer between them. Therefore, even if we imagine that the Russians know the exact coordinates of one windmill and hit it, they will not damage the others. Fortunately, during the entire time of the full-scale war, not a single windmill in our country has been damaged by enemy shelling. If we go back to this terrible winter, the technology here is so modern, and and if it's freezing, snowy, we know that even airplanes don't fly. Sometimes when the weather is not flying, what do you do when the weather is bad? The guys found a drone that is similar to an agricultural drone that sprays chemicals on the fields. When there's ice and your crane is covered in ice, but this drone couldn't fly more than 35 to 40 meters, and we needed to raise the drone to a height of 140 meters, so the guys modernized it. They did. They upgraded, and we took it up. Did you take some kind of liquid that dissolves ice and spray it? Yes, we did. That's cool. We were experimenting, we sprayed the crane. This can be compared to when an airplane is preparing for takeoff in winter, and a machine like this drives up and sprays the winds with a liquid that prevents ice from appearing on the wind surface. So this is a semi-aviation technology, right? Yes, it's cool. We realize that we are filming this during a full-scale war, and unfortunately the enemy is very close at the time of filming. Kursen region is not far away, and the enemy is there. As for safety, firstly, the safety of these expensive structures, and secondly, the safety of the employees who maintain them. If there is an alarm, we had five missile attacks a day, and the guys come down five times and had to hide. And where to hide in the field? There are mobile shelters in the field. Here they are. They look like small reinforced concrete boxes. During construction, they were transported from place to place to be as close as possible to the installation of wind turbines. Here's a concrete structure, natural light, because there is an opening and the benches, which is quite comfortable. There could be more than 10 people here. Yes. Imagine the station workers spent more than 300 hours in these mini bomb shelters. But despite everything, the work continued throughout the winter. We often saw these missiles passing right next to the station. We survived the first blackout and were offered to speed up the construction because we had to support Odessa and Mikolaev. The blackouts and this generation was golden. Therefore, we understand that winter is ahead and we need to move forward and add and increase this generation. While it's fine weather mends your sails, it's true. Let's winter to the blackouts, it was this wind farm that helped the power grid of south of Ukraine to survive. Ten wind turbines, which were operating at full capacity at the time, helped the Odessa region a lot. What a crane! It will be the first time in Ukraine that will change the generator, because the generator is over there, at the very top, 125 meters, that's right. The unique crane that helped to install the wind turbine is still here, because it's needed not only for construction, but also for maintenance maintenance of the wind turbines. Today workers were planning to replace the generator on one of the wind turbines, but the work was postponed due to the strong wind. I'm going to take a closer look at this miracle machine. Just imagine the length of this crane's boom is 144 meters. Hello everyone, hello. Even our crane operator came out. Hello, hello. What's your name, please? Vladislav. Are you the one who drives this thing? Yes, I do. May I come up to see your workplace? Sure, just go around. This is impressive. I'm going to take a look. 
I'm going to the guest seat. We're watching the wind too. At the moment we can't replace the generator as we are over the limits. A wind is good for generating power with a windmill, but bad for work. Yes, it is. Why is it dangerous? Of course. What could happen? We could just lose a crane, that's all. The crane will just fall. If you take a chance right now when the wind is strong and hang a 20-ton generator on the boom and then try to lift it to a height of 120 meters, the crane will collapse. And it's good if it doesn't hit the windmill. Can I try it? I've never operated a crane like this before. Go ahead. Well, friends, I've tried all kinds of professions all over the world, but I've never been a crane operator and I have never been on a crane like this. We have two paddles in front of us, like an excavator, and by smoothly pushing them forward, yes, we can then go. Slowly we push it forward. It's moving. This huge machine is moving. It's fantastic. How much does this crane weigh? About 500 tons. 500 tons, people. For the first time in the history of the world inside out, I'm driving a machine that weighs 500 tons. Thank you for this unique experience. The windmill is stopped. This is unpleasant news for the workers, but for us, on the contrary, it's a unique opportunity. It means that we can climb to the very top. Given that the blades are not moving now, I dream of climbing to the very top. Please do. Friends, this is exclusive, only in the world inside out for the first time. Here is Alexander turn around this windmill, and we're going to climb to the very top to a height of 125 meters and see what it looks like from the inside and from above. Get ready. The windmill is not a tourist attraction, and you can only go up there with a specialist. Since the elevator is designed for only two people, Alexandra and I will take turns going up after the briefing. Alexandra Dmitriev is the first to get ready. Of course, the safety rules are almost like in mountaineering. Alexandra, have you ever climbed to such a height like this? No, not like this. It's the first time in my life. Okay, Alexandra, see you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, now it's my turn. First of all, we put on the safety system. Very strong, very heavy, and very reliable. Ready? It's done. It looks just like a rocket that's about to go into space. And this is what it looks like from the inside. This is a small elevator, cool. And you can see how huge the pipe is. From the outside it looks like narrow, but here it is already, wow. Alexander already upstairs, so I'm going to film myself from now on. So I'm getting into the elevator. This is the smallest elevator in my life. I've never been in one like this before. It's very narrow. This is a wide-angle lens. It enlarges the space, visually enlarges. Here, in fact, I even have to take a breath to get in. I'm going to stretch out my arm and you'll see that there's very little space. So, who's with me? Sergei. They closed it. And let's go. Slowly, very slowly. Goodbye. Very, very, very slowly this elevator is going. The elevator doesn't take us to the highest point of the windmill. The last section has to be overcome by a ladder. There is a ladder here, and you can use it to go upstairs. Okay, let's go up. We are at the very top. It's very exciting and interesting. I could not even imagine that I could see this. The feeling is incredible. 
And this is what the top of the power plant looks like. Is the current here? 35,000 volts, right? This black box with the cable is, so to speak, the main nerve of the windmill. All the current that this gigantic wind power plant collects goes here. It's a box, it's protected. It's just 35,000 volts, for instance. 35,000 here. Alexandra, come on. I can already feel the fresh air. Fresh air. They say dreams do come true. Wow. And besides the fact that dreams come true, wow, the top of the wind farm. And we had added it at 125 meters. Wow, it's a fantastic view. Higher and higher. We're going up. I want to go even higher. Here is a fantastic panoramic view from above. I'm coming to the edge. Holding on tight. I have a safety rope. Wow! This is how the wind farm looks like from above. Very cool. Very strong wind. I'm going to put on my glasses because of the tears. Thanks to such power plants, we can be less dependent of nuclear power energy from thermal or hydroelectric power plants, because the wind has always been there and always will be, and we need to use it, especially now during the war, when the enemy regularly shells our energy infrastructure. This is our energy security. This is our energy frontline, and it's very, very important. Once here, I felt incredibly proud of Ukraine. The construction of the Tillyhul wind farm right now now, right during the war, is the symbol of our resistance and invincibility. In order to provide the entirety of Ukraine with electricity exclusively from wind, we need seven and a half thousand of these giants, and it will cost about 50 billion euros. Well, of course, it's very expensive, but we're definitely moving in the right direction, and we're 19 windmills closer to forgetting what blackouts are. The next episode, a spectacle that takes your breath away, Carnival in Rio de Janeiro is no match. Unique traditions that we knew very little about. That's it, I'm chained up. Don't break my ribs. I got punched in the nose, so hard it's crazy. These are the little things that make a real Christmas miracle happen. The Bushkin man proved that you have to live even when there's a war in the country, even when there's a tragedy in the family. You have to go on living, not stop. Those are the people who manage to keep hope alive despite the circumstances. We want to bring joy to people, even in such neighborhoods where there are still one or two families living in houses. We want to bring them some kind of kindness, warmth, something we can do. Historical chronicles of Christmas celebration in the first year of full-scale war, exclusive in the world inside out Ukraine. The World Inside Out with Metro Komarov, Ukraine.